Welcome back to my channel everyone. I'm Charles from Charles in Photography. Today's tutorial is going to be on how to photograph lunar eclipse images. Now I'm doing this because on the 26th of May this year we are going to have a lunar eclipse. It will be visible in most of the southern hemisphere and maybe in a few other areas. And here I live in Australia, it will be visible throughout all of Australia. And in Brisbane the lunar eclipse will be at its maximum at around 25 past 9 at night. This tutorial goes hand in hand also with another tutorial that I've done and I'll link it here now on how to edit lunar eclipse images because it's one thing to actually go out take photos of lunar eclipse but some people struggle to know how to actually edit lunar eclipse images so this tutorial on editing lunar eclipse images should help those who've never edited images of a lunar eclipse. Now it's always a good idea when you know that something like a lunar eclipse is coming that we have some planning, choosing where we'd like to go, the sort of gear that we want to use, what are we going to use our images for, are we going to use our images of the lunar eclipse as a single image or are we going to use them as a composite image. Now for gear just about any digital SLR or mirrorless camera will allow to photograph a lunar eclipse. It really depends on the lens that you're using. Now the minimum focal length for a lens really is about 200 millimeters and the longer the focal length the more detail you are going to get in your images. Now this shows you the different focal lengths 200 millimeters, 300 millimeters, 400 and 500 millimeters. It gives you an idea of how big the moon looks like when you actually take a photo with a crop sensor digital SLR. Now I took these images just a week ago with the last full moon with my Nikon D500 and my Nikon 200 to 500 millimeters and you can see there's quite a lot of detail there but the more you zoom in the more detailed you see and this is quite important because it also means if you start cropping in you'll actually see a lot more detail and the image will be clearer the longer focal length you have. Really between 3 and 500 mils not too many people have a 600 mil zoom lens so between 3 and 500 mils will give you some very good images. Now as well as your camera and lens you also want a good tripod because if there's movement in your tripod if it's a bit wonky then you're not likely to get sharp images. Now we have the tripod, the camera, the lens. The last thing that connects our camera to our tripod is the tripod head. You can either choose a bald head or a pan and tilt. For most photography I actually quite like the bald head. It gives me very good flexibility but I find that when I'm shooting images of the moon I actually prefer the pan and tilt because it actually gives me a bit more stability. A bald head seems to want to sort of move around sideways as soon as you sort of release it but a pan and tilt will only go two ways. It'll move sideways or up and down. So I actually prefer using a pan and tilt head when I'm photographing lunar eclipse images. Now there are two ways to photograph the moon. Landscape orientation like this or portrait orientation like this. In landscape orientation the moon is actually going to travel quite quickly across your frame but in portrait orientation it's actually going to take much longer to go through the frame. So whenever I'm shooting the moon I always prefer to photograph it in, in portrait orientation especially for a lunar eclipse because this means that you will spend less time reframing your shot. Now this year the lunar eclipse happens on a rising moon and when I actually frame for the lunar eclipse this year I will actually set the moon in the bottom right hand corner of my frame. This means that it will give me the maximum amount of time before I actually have to recompose and reframe my shot. Something that you have to be very mindful of is that when the moon starts getting quite dark then one thing that you have to be mindful of is as the moon moves across your frame if it gets very close 
to the full lunar eclipse, let's say around nine o'clock, then I would consider reframing my shot before the moon gets too dark. Because it, once the moon is quite dark, if you want to reframe it, you're going to find it very hard seeing it in your frame. So before it gets too dark, reframe your shot and then put the moon in the bottom right hand corner. This will maximize the time when it's all dark and you won't have to reframe. Now, most zoom lenses have got infinity markers on. They could be a line or they could be a small figure of eight. And a lot of people think that, okay, I'm going to zoom out to 500 mil, just put on the infinity marker and I'm going to end up with a focused image because it depends where the infinity mark is for. It could be for 200 or it could be 500. So before you go out on the night, check the infinity marker. Check whether the infinity marker is for 200 or for 500 in the case of this Nikon lens. I focus at the start when the moon is nice and bright. And then I disengage autofocus. I mean disengage, I use back button focus on my camera. So once I actually focus, touching the shutter button here isn't going to readjust my focus. But if you set your shutter button to take the photos and to focus, then you are going to have to disengage autofocus on your lens or if your camera has it built in, in the camera itself. Because every time you're going to touch that shutter button, if you haven't done this, it will try to refocus on the moon and you don't want that. So make sure that once you're in focus, disengage autofocus. The moon will actually stay in the same focal plane for the whole night. Do you use a timer delay on the camera or do you use a timer remote? I prefer a timer remote. That is because I can set the camera to mirror lock. And the way mirror locks is when you press a button, the mirror goes up, you wait a couple of seconds. So you might count to three or four, then you press it again. And that's when the picture is taken. So it eliminates all camera shake. If you don't have a timer remote, then you can just use the, the timer delay in the camera. So most of the time, the minimum is two seconds. I prefer to set it to five seconds. This just gives you a couple of extra seconds for everything to settle down. So you press a button, gives it five seconds, and it takes a photo. I prefer to use the timer remote with mirror lockup. <laughs> Now normally, if I'm photographing the full moon, my shutter speed could be between 1 1 25th of a second to 1 200th of a second. And the ISO is normally between ISO 100 and ISO 200. I could easily shoot at 1 200th of a second and end up with some good images and I wouldn't really even need a tripod. Now, when we're photographing a lunar eclipse, we cannot be shooting at that fast shutter speed, especially if you're shooting at 500 millimeters, because the moon gets dark. So I'm going to have to drop my shutter speed and I'm going to have to increase my ISO to actually see the moon. In 2018, I found the sweet spot for taking photos of the lunar eclipse when it was its maximum was 1 50th of a second. And my ISO was 6,400. Now, if I wanted to try to get my shutter speed at 1 100th of a second, the ISO would have been 12,800. Way too high and too much digital noise. I tried to bring my shutter speed down to around 1 25th of a second, and my ISO was actually at 3,200. I just couldn't get a sharp image at 1 25th of a second. So I settled on 1 50th of a second and I put up with the high ISO. Now on this lens, my minimum aperture that I could shoot at was f5.6. If you're using a lens that allows you to shoot lower than f5.6, let's say f4 or f2.8, then you could either shoot at a faster shutter speed or at a lower ISO. There's so many variables that it's very hard to actually for me to say this is what you should do. The best that I can do is to give you some advice of what I did and then you go out there and you try it. And on the night, you'll have quite a bit of time that you can actually experiment with different shutter speeds and different ISOs. If you know that your camera isn't good at, let's say, 
a higher ISO than ISO 4000, then you're going to have to try to work around that. When we start photographing the eclipse, the moon will be full. So your shutter speed will be quite high, your ISO will be quite low, but as it gets darker, this is when you're actually going to have to play between your ISO and your shutter speed. And here you can see some screenshots that I've taken through an app to show you how high the moon is going to be at the start of the lunar eclipse. So the lunar eclipse starts at around quarter to seven and you can see it's on the eastern horizon, not that far from the horizon. But as the night progresses, the moon just travels further upwards. By quarter to eight, it's actually much higher. 10 to past nine, it's much higher again. By 25 past nine, it's actually quite a way up in the sky. So if you only want to photograph when the moon is that reddish color, then it doesn't matter where you are. It could, you could have buildings around you. You should be able to see the moon by this stage because it'll actually be quite high. But if you're wanting to photograph the whole stage of the lunar eclipse, then you should find a location that gives you a clear view to the eastern horizon. So you could be at the beach. If you're in Brisbane, you could be at the Mount Cutha lookout, anywhere where you've got a clear line of sight to the eastern horizon. So I actually recommend using an app like PhotoPills if you're actually not sure where you want to photograph and whether the foreground that's in front of you could be a distraction. With PhotoPills, it's quite easy to see because it overlays what you're seeing with where the moon is. So you just dial in the date and just track the moon with the app and it'll show you where the moon is going to be. So if you're just wanting to start photographing the lunar eclipse from about eight o'clock at night, then you can see, okay, well by eight o'clock, I've actually cleared all the high rise buildings. You'll actually see a clear view of the night sky. If you want to photograph the whole lot, then you might say, okay, well this position here is not good because I can't see the moon. I've got buildings in front of me. I've got to find another location. Now, when it comes to editing your images, like I said at the start, I've actually done a video tutorial on how to edit lunar eclipse images. But the one thing that you've really got to think about is if you're going to use these images in a composite image, let's say you decide to take photos from the start to the end, so from full moon to full moon, all the way in between, then if you're going to crop your images, crop them at the start so that the moon is exactly the same size throughout your whole set of images. If you're only going to use one or two photos separately, then it doesn't matter if you crop at the start or at the end. It's only important if you're going to use them as a set of images because the last thing you want is the moon to be different size. It's really going to look awkward in your photos. Another thing that you have to remember, and I talk about this in the editing video is that you keep the moon the same color, especially like at the start and at the end. If the white balance of the moon is different, the start to the end, it just won't look right. This is something that you have to be mindful about. A lunar eclipse looks quite nice, but by itself, maybe just share one on social media. Most of the time, it's actually quite good to actually use a lunar eclipse photo with another photo. It could be a nightscape of the city or of the countryside. This image here I've actually done just for this tutorial and you can see on the left this is what the night is going to look like. The Milky Way will be just below the moon at the time of the eclipse. So I've actually found an image in my archive of the Milky Way in the same direction. This was taken at Lake Somerset about four years ago and I've actually superimposed the moon in the image and you can see that it actually looks quite natural. This is the key if you're doing composite images to try to keep it natural and all I've done on the moon is I've just softened the edge of the moon so that it doesn't look like a cut and paste. Now I've used an image of the Milky Way because I like photographing astro but you could easily superimpose it on any other type of image. So 
it's up to you. You've just got to make it look realistic. So I hope this video tutorial has helped you understand how to photograph lunar eclipse images. What you need to photograph a lunar eclipse. The camera settings that are advisable to actually give you the required shots. Like I said during the video, there's too many variables, but the settings that I've given you advice on should give you a starting point. If you found value in this video tutorial, give me a thumbs up. I'd appreciate if you subscribe to my YouTube channel and all the best in photographing this upcoming lunar eclipse.